Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Josh Farley. It is my great pleasure to be with you tonight um, as we celebrate and raise funds for the Kitsap County Historical Society and Museum. So what are we going to do this evening? We have a wonderful schedule of events for you, um, but before we launch right into that, I wanted to do an introduction uh, just to tell you as your master's, uh, Master of Ceremonies tonight, your MC, why I love history. Um, and if those of you who follow the Kitsap Sun, this might not come as much of a surprise. Uh, I'm a big history buff myself, um, and I love the Historical Society. I work with them on a number of articles to find information and um, to, that really en enable me to uh, provide the context and relevance in every story that we have in the Kitsap Sun. And so it's my great pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, one of the things that I want to talk about briefly is, of course, uh, we have uh, an election coming up this next Tuesday. And a lot has happened this year with regard to COVID-19 and other big stories. But of course, we may be witnessing something historic right here, right now. And um, I am often comforted as a journalist by the words of Maya Angelou. Uh, you probably heard this quote before. She said, history, despite its wretched pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. And I take these words to heart. I wrote them down as a young journalist and they sit by my desk uh, each and every day uh, that I do my reporting. We all share a passion for history. And I think uh, that's something that is so special. Um, and I know that, uh, that you are watching tonight. You are also someone who shares that bond with me. As a reporter, I like to think of myself as someone who writes the first draft of history in some ways. But our, our friends at the Historical Society Museum go much deeper than that. It's not just an interest for us though, you and me. It's relevant, it's real, and I think we take it as a true obligation to keep our history alive and relevant, not only for our interest's sake, not only because we just like history, but because by doing so, we're helping the leaders, the decision makers, and the residents today understand from the past learn from the past and try to create a better future. And even when it can feel like it's failing us, we must never stop trying and we must always attempt to learn from history. So I thank you. I'm grateful to you for uh, tuning in tonight. And I think, again, we have a great program for you. Tonight, of course, as uh, we are on Halloween Eve is a very macabre lesson of history. Um, it started innocently enough, the Institute of Natural Therapeutics, started by a doctor named Linda Hazard, but you're going to hear about how it soon became deadly. We have the great pleasure of having with us tonight Greg Olson, the author of Starvation Heights, uh, and I want to encourage those of you with questions uh, for Greg to ask them on YouTube here to please put them in the comments and after Greg is done giving his great presentation, we are going to take a few of those. Now I wanna turn it over to Angie Thomaser, one of the board members at the Kitsap County Historical Society and Museum. And she's going to tell you more about why, uh, what the cause is tonight. Angie. Hi, Josh. Thank you. Yes, I'm Angie. Um, the Kitsap County Historical Society Museum has been um, honored for um, being able to preserve and both share uh, our, our county's history for over 72 years and counting. Um, it is our mission as a board to ensure that everybody has access to all of these great resources that we have in this museum as well as in our archives. Um, last year, we had over 15,000 visitors to the, the museum. And one of our exhibits called um, Beyond Borders featured the Indipino community of Bainbridge Island. It was a huge success and it welcomed um, many community members as well as um, academics and just history lovers from across the globe. We were very excited about that. Uh, 2020 has been challenging. Access to the museum has been limited. And um, because of that, we've had to 
get a little bit creative. Um, in, the, in the break, we have taken some time to uh, really reconnect and build some relationships with community members. We have thought of some great ideas about how to get virtual content to you. And we've also done some much needed renovation to the museum, um, including some new exhibits that are interactive and those are under construction now. And we're excited to show those to you soon. Um, the museum is located in downtown Bremerton and our doors are open and we hope that you will come visit us. Um, we're not gonna be shy here. This is a fundraiser and uh, your dollars are really important to us. Um, it brings us great programming that you see in the museum. It also funds uh, events like this evening. Um, but beyond that, it really keeps our lights on and our doors open and it keeps our staff employed. And those are all pretty critical things to ensure that uh, these resources are available for you moving forward and for future generations. Um, luckily, it's pretty easy right now to donate and we hope that you will. We, we ask that you will be kind and generous and open your wallet and uh, it's pretty easy. We need you to go to the uh, kidsapmuseum.org website. There's a link you can easily click. Uh, please open those wallets and click, click away, donate what you can. We sure appreciate it and every dollar counts. Um, I wanted to give a really special thanks to uh, all of you at home. Thank you for taking a Friday to join us. Thank you for your gifts. We appreciate that. Uh, we also want to give a big thanks to our sponsors who have donated generously to make tonight happen for you. Um, we also want to give a shout out to our members and all of our volunteers and our very enthusiastic staff. And last but not least, we want to give a huge thank you to the very spooky and very talented entertainment who is uh, going to give us a great show this evening. So thank you, Josh, and thank you, Greg, for that. And I think with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Josh. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Angie. Um, now, don't forget uh, that when you're looking at YouTube right down below, you can see the scroll there. Why don't you uh, ask a question as they come up to you as we go on in the program. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce our special guest. Uh, his name is Greg Olson. He really needs no introduction. But I want to tell you, he is a best-selling author who has written 10 nonfiction books, more than 20 novels, including a novella as well. And he's been featured on all kinds of TV shows and other media. I can't imagine you have not heard of Greg Olson. He's been featured in numerous news publications throughout the years as well. Starvation Heights uh, was originally published in 1997. As you can see, Greg has been wheeled in. Uh, there uh, at the Kitsap Historical Society Museum. Uh, he has, uh, it's continued over the years to attract attention for decades since it was published uh, about that quack Dr. Hazard and her sanitarium. In fact, Greg lives and continues to live right in Olala, the very place where it occurs. And I would like to welcome you, Greg. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing better now that this mask is off. Um, nurse and she gave me the enema treatment just shortly before we went on air here. Oh, okay. And I want people to know I will be able to walk again, probably by the end of the program. <laughs> okay, well, take it away, Greg. All right. A lot of people ask me about Starvation Heights and about writing that book and why I chose that particular story. So I kind of like to start with that before we get into what the story is all about. Um, my family moved to Alala when my twin girls were in third grade. So they're 35. Now you can do the math. And I was just looking for a wonderful place to raise a family and continue my work as a true crime writer. And when I got there, Olala being a very small place, almost everybody knew right away that I was a writer and I wrote about crime stuff. And trust me, I get this a lot. When people come to me and meet me for the first time, they say, oh, you know, I had a murder in my family. My aunt Betty hit my uncle Fred over the head with a fire and pan, frying pan and killed him. And I would say, oh, that's terrible. You know, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. And they would say, well, I think there's a book in that. And I would tell them a lot of times, well, it's a terrible thing that happened to your family, but it's not a story that can sustain a book. So when a woodcutter came to my door on our first day there in Olala and said, well, you should write a story about our local murder. I thought to myself, oh yeah, Okay, bring it on. Is it Aunt Bessie this time? What is the story? 
And in this case, he said, well, it was about a doctor who murdered a bunch of people around the turn of the century. I can take you to where it all happened. So I got in his car and we drove up the hill off of Orchard. If you've ever been to Olala, it's one of the highest points on, in, our, in our area where when the trees were all gone, you could see Puget Sound. It was, it's that high up. And I went to this house and a woman named Opal Jones told me, she said, I've got this story. I have a, a, a couple of news clippings. I think you ought to, ought to look into it. She was great. I mean, she opened up this little bag that she had with these old yellow, really like brittle photo, like um, brittle news clippings that they were falling apart as I read them. And she said, it all happened right here. Greg, you should write this book. And I looked at it and I thought to myself, okay, there is something here. I mean, this is about alternative medicine. This is about a woman running an enterprise in the middle of nowhere and all these murders are happening. I'm in, I'm totally in on this one. So that's, that's how I got to get to the story, which was by somebody telling me about it. And for me to be as lucky as I could be in landing in Olala, Washington, which is my home and a place I love more than any place in the world. And I wanna tell you about our dirty little secret. Next slide. All right, and we can advance one more. It all centers around a woman named Linda Burfield Hazard. We're gonna get there, guys. This is technical difficulties, it happens, right? All right, one of the things that I always thought about, and this is something that I want you to think about as you're listening to this story, I think that every little town or every big city has a secret, has a dark story, a dark history that I think people really would be interested in knowing about. Sometimes people will talk about them openly, sometimes they'll keep them hidden. And it was my job in writing this story was to try to pull together all those pieces to tell what happened in the early 1900s and up to 1938 when Linda died. So let's talk about her a little bit. Your perspective on this whole thing hinges on whether you think she's a healer or a killer. Whether you think she really believed in what she was doing as a way to help people, or was she just in it for the money? Even after all these years, after writing the book 20 some years ago, after thinking about the case so much as I have, I'm not really sure. So that's what makes it interesting. We don't really know the truth. Next. Here's her idea. Linda Hazard was a self-proclaimed naturopathic doctor. She really didn't have an education. I mean, she said she did. She talked about how she had gone to college, how she studied under leading um, authorities at the time. But the truth about it was whenever we tried to look into her background, there was a dead end. I mean, she, the college that she went to somehow burned down. So there were no records about what she had, if she had a degree or not. So there's that kind of mystery about her. Was she really educated? Was she really a doctor? What was she? By the time she moved to Washington, she was grandfathered in as being a doctor. So she arrived in Washington around 1908. And she arrived with a little book called Fasting for the Cure of Disease. And in this book, she outlaid her entire system of cure. And, and I want to say something about that. She believed that no matter what was wrong with you, whether you were, you know, infirm because you had a, a troubled kidney or whether you had digestive problems or whether you were bald like I am, whatever problem you had, she could fix through the cure of fasting. And she believed I can get you down to skin and bones. I can get all the toxins out of your body. I can recalibrate your entire physiology just by having you follow my regimen. So we'll talk about that next. Here's the regimen. It's super simple and it's super deadly. Her idea was, I'm gonna give you a little bit of water as she might boil some asparagus in it and she's gonna give you a massage and she's gonna do this over a long period of time. You're not gonna have any solid food. You won't, you know, whatever, you know, she tells you to do, you've gotta do it. And she was persuasive. So you think about it, asparagus water or maybe tomato water, you know, we're not talking soup here, guys. We're talking about a clear liquid that you're gonna get. 
you know, I was thinking about, I was in the bathroom earlier and I was thinking about asparagus water and those bedpans at Starvation Heights. And I kind of wonder about that now. <laughs> I mean, never mind. But what I'm looking at is a treatment that included a massage that was so rigorous and so painful that the people who were getting the massage were, they cried. They were in tears over the agony of it. And every time she hit you, which is what she did, she balled up her fist and pummeled your stomach like that. And she would say this, eliminate, eliminate, eliminate. And what that meant was she wanted all that stuff out of you. And she used one other technique to get that stuff out of you. She used the enema, which was, she called it the internal bath. And if you've ever had an enema, I can't even think if I ever have had one, uh, maybe to, other than tonight. Um, but, you know, it's pumping water into you to clean you out from the outside and having that water gush out again. Isn't this lovely, right? So she would do this and these enemas could last as long as eight hours, even 10, where these people would be subjected to nothing to eat, just liquid, pummeling massage and an enema. And that was gonna get you clean. Next. There's always a complication in a true crime story, and that usually involves the relationships with people. I mean, a lot of people do things that are deadly and terrible on their own. But what fascinates me more as a writer are those people who do things together. Those people who align their uh, desires and their plans for the future in doing something that is unthinkable, but they just have to do it, right? They can't do it on their own. They need that other partner. And there are lots of cases in the annals of crime where it's been two people. You think about like the Hillside Strangler case in California, it was those two cousins. There were cases, there are like many, many cases of people who work together in pairs, right? So we look at Dr. Hazard and I wonder about this more than anything when I wrote the book. Sam Hazard, her husband, he was a flim flam. He was a no good ne'er do well. There's no doubt about it. He stole money from the government when he was in Annapolis. He was at the army um, as a purser and as a uh, in doing payroll and cashing checks on his own for himself. That was one thing that he did. He escaped that. He didn't get charged there because he went AWOL. But he resurfaced later in Minneapolis and he met two women there. He met a woman named Viva Fitzpatrick and Linda Burfield Hazard, and he married both of them. Linda was astounded and she was upset. She couldn't believe that Sam loved anyone other than her. So there was a big bigamy trial and Sam ended up going to prison. Okay, this speaks to Sam's character because none of the things that Linda did after or before all of the bad things were in cahoots with Sam Hazard. So I'm not saying, you know, she's some goody two shoes, you know, but she probably had an ambition. I, there's no doubt about it, but it's quite possible that this is another case where a, a man with a plan got in there and started to use her. Next. Think about this too. Here's a woman working in medicine in the early years of when we're just trying to figure things out, like I think we're like we're still trying to figure them out today, by the way. But back then there was a big controversy in terms of what kind of medicine we should be practicing. Should we practice surgery to cure a problem? Should we use drugs or should we use natural treatments in order to help people? And in this particular case, Linda was a proponent of natural treatments. And she had a lot of people lining up I mean, there, you know, we're looking here at Ivor Haglin. If you're a Northwesterner, you certainly know the Ivor Haglin name. You've probably been to Ivor's Fish Bar um, and had their great fish and chips. Ivor Haglin's mother was one of Dr. Hazard's victims. She was an immigrant, Swedish immigrant, that went to Dr. Hazard for treatment and ended up dying after a 48-day fast. Ivor himself, as a little boy, took the fasting treatment from Dr. Hazard. And as you can judge by looking at this picture here of him later in life, he certainly looks okay to me. So he survived the treatment. She had another patient that died, and then another, and then another. But all along, people were thinking, well, you know, is it their problem, their fault, or was Linda Hazard the purveyor of some kind of deathly treatment? No, no one really knew until later. Next. 
this is what the whole book is about. And the story of Starvation Nights would not exist if not for Claire and Dora Williamson, who came to Seattle for a treatment um, in 1911. And here's how they got there. They were women, you know, here's there the two women on the left in the picture here. They were two heiresses. They had a considerable fortune that today would amount to multi-millions, really. Their father was an army surgeon with the British Army in India. They were raised in England and in Australia. And they came to, you know, all over the world. They would come and travel after they were orphaned. Their parents were dead and they were in, the, they were in their mid-30s. They would seek treatment in different spas. In those days, in the, around the turn of the century, 1911, 1915, in those days, it was all about getting a treatment somewhere. It was like, like maybe we would today think of like, it'd be really great if I could go to a spa and get some kind of a treatment. In those days, people were flocking to places with mud baths and with electrohydrotherapy, you know, where they would get into a, a superheated water or even um, crawl into a tube with um, electrical coils like others had purveyed. These were women and women who really were looking for something. And it wasn't necessarily they were looking for a cure of a problem. They were looking also, I believe, for adventure and excitement. Neither had married and they were sitting there in the lobby at the Empress Hotel in beautiful British Columbia up there on the island. And they were thinking, you know, I see an ad. It's for this woman doctor in Seattle who has got a great fasting treatment. And so the two sisters talk about this. They think, well, you know, Seattle's not too far away. Maybe we could go there. Maybe we could get treatment there. They didn't tell anybody that they were going to go there because by then Claire and Dora, the Williamson sisters, had basically told everybody everything about their lives, about going to these treatments, and they were getting the cold shoulder from those very few relatives that they had that they were maybe being frivolous. But not to be deterred, they were gonna go to Seattle and take this treatment from this woman who was really gonna change their lives. Claire, she was older, but she was the one who was really the one that wanted them to go. She didn't really have a physical ailment that I know of. Her sister, Dora, claimed to have a tipped back uterus, whatever that is. And they were going to go help that uterus get in order by going down to Seattle. Next. So here's what happened. The two sisters get on, you know, they come down to Seattle and they're excited. They're going to be going to this beautiful place called Wilderness Heights Sanitarium in Olala. And there, you know, when you read the book, you'll read their letters where they talk about how excited they are about seeing all the animals in the woods and how Dr. Hazard had explained that the treatment would be, you know, in a forested setting and that the logs had been carved into seating and it was just going to be fantastic. And they were excited. They, they couldn't really wait to get there. So I really want to mark that for you. They were going for an adventure as well as a cure. But when they got to Seattle, Dr. Hazard said, well, my sanitarium in Alala is not ready. You know, I can put you in an apartment. And they were very disappointed. But Dr. Hazard said, well, as soon as Olala is ready, I'll take you there. So they went into this apartment and that's where the treatment began. That's where a lot of the bypassers, people that were not really friends with them, so they didn't know anybody, saw things that were going on that really disturbed them. There was a nurse there that thought maybe the women were getting too much um, of a harsh treatment. They were crying and they were starving and they were miserable. And they, you know, one woman said she was emptying one of the, the cans of liquid that had come from the enema. And there were white particles, like she thought maybe they could be intestines or something. Part of their body was dissipating. These women were going from a normal weight, a robust weight, to like 50 pounds. They shrunk to like skin and bone. And Dr. Hazard said, well, my sanitarium is not quite ready, but I can take you to my house in Olala, which is what they did. They went down and, and to catch a private launch. But while they were at Coleman Dock, which is the same dock where the ferry landing is now in Seattle, while they were at that dock, a lawyer showed up. And this is really important to understand the story. The lawyer showed up 
and they changed the sister's will, leaving everything should they die to Dr. Hazard. Next. Olala at that time, you know, it's, it's not like it was, is today for sure. But in some ways, there are a lot of similarities. It was the end of the earth. There was no electricity there. In fact, Olala didn't get electricity until the late 1920s. So Olala was really out there. And it was populated by people who were farmers. And maybe there were a few people in the shipping industry and a few local, you know, there was a hotel and a bakery and a few kinds of little businesses like that. But the main thing was logging. There was fisheries and then there were strawberries later. So these were agricultural people who had come mostly from Finland and Sweden. And many of them did not speak English. So Dr. Hazard was very impressive to them. Here was a woman, an American woman, who was a doctor who walked around and told people that this is the way things are and, and I'm smart and I'm educated and I'm gonna donate $50 to the Good Roads Committee. She was considered just un, unapproachable. You just couldn't even, you know, the regular people thought she was on a way higher level than they were. So when they brought these women in and other patients later and saw them wasting away, they looked the other way because they really didn't know what else they could do. They were afraid of her. Next. This is an image of the house where it all happened. Um, doesn't exist anymore, but this is in Olala and um, the Historical Society actually has some photographs of this house at the time, which um, I think you can see online. But um, in this house, these women were sequestered. They were not even allowed to talk to each other as the treatment went on. Claire and Dora were in the upstairs bedroom. You can see it there in this photograph above that bush. They were in that bedroom. And at the time, you know, you could look out that window and you could see Mount Rainier and Puget Sound. Of course, today there, you can't because it's all forested again, but the hillside had been completely logged off. So they're there and they're basically trapped. They're losing weight. They are down to 45 pounds and they're scared. They're thinking, you know, are we gonna get better? And Linda Hazard would always say tomorrow. Absolutely tomorrow you will be better, I promise you. And Claire was the one who was thinking, I, I don't know if I believe this. And Dora was saying, well, you know, Dr. Hazard's treatment is working. I, I just know it is, I feel, I feel it coming. Think about that. You can barely move, you're so weak that these women had to crawl on the floor of that upstairs room because they could no longer walk. They could hear Dr. Hazard downstairs doing whatever it was she was doing. And every time they asked about their own health or whether they could get a message out to somebody, she said no. One time Claire crawled on her hands and knees down the staircase and she went to the mailbox and she wanted to see if she could get a letter out and she was caught. And after that happened, she was the mailbox itself was removed. So there was no communication out. But something funny did happen. And we don't know, this is the greatest mystery of all. Someone, and I believe it was a staff member, sent a message out to Dr. Hazard. I mean, sent a message out to the girl's governess, the one who took care of them when they were children. Margaret was her name, Margaret Conway. They sent a message out and Margaret Conway was in Melbourne, Australia. She received a message that said, come to an Olala at once, first class. This sort of shocked Margaret because Margaret thought to herself, well, you know, I would never go first class. Why in the world would they say first class? Uh, you know, she knew her place in society at that time. And first class for a woman of her stature was not gonna happen, but it had, the money had been sent and the cable had been sent. So the rescue was gonna happen. Next. Let's take a look at these pictures. So you have to really understand that and forgive the fact that the other guy there is shorter. It's the same guy. It's just a bad photo. <laughs> this first photograph shows a guy after a, I think it was a 40 day fast. This is what the people looked like that were running around the house and walking around the grounds. This is what the people looked like that the neighbors saw come to their window and ask for food. 
these same neighbors who were frightened to go against Dr. Hazard, they'd say, well, you know, they'd ask for food. And one lady, when I interviewed her said, you know, my, my mom would sneak them food, but she made them promise not to tell that Dr. Hazard, you know, because we were afraid. We thought if she knew she would do something to us. So you got to really know this. These people are starving to death and every day they're waiting and hoping that they will be rescued or they will recover. And this is photographs, believe it or not, are from one of Dr. Hazard's books where she's trying to show how her treatment was so great. Um, next. So as the women are kind of getting weaker and weaker, the one who really didn't want to go to Starvation Heights or a wilderness heights, as, as Dr. Hazard called it, is the one who died. It was Claire. She had only gone there because her sister Dora had insisted that they do so. So when Claire died, Dr. Hazard told Dora that, you know what, I will care for you for the rest of your life. That's what your sister wanted. I've taken control of your sister's assets and I'm gonna be managing them uh, for me and for you. And that, you know, Ad Ad Dora was thinking to herself, well, this isn't right. I, I gotta get out of here. My sister's dead and, and I I'm scared now. Um, and Dr. Hazard kind of said to her, look, you're in no condition to have any thoughts of your own. You are an imbecile. You're stupid. You don't have a clue. I know what's best. Next. When Claire died, she weighed less than 50 pounds. And Dr. Hazard had a unique ability. Not only could she be a doctor and care for people, but she was also the medical examiner for her, all of her patients. So whenever anyone died at, at Wilderness Heights, Dr. Hazard would be the one that would assign the cause of death. And in Claire's case, she said it was cirrhosis of the liver that was the cause of death. Of course, you know, Claire uh, weighed like, I think she really actually weighed 38 pounds when she died. So I think we all know that cirrhosis of the liver didn't cause that death. You know, Dr. Hazard would later try to prove that she was correct by showing um, the, the liver she would bring the liver out of a little bag that she kept and she would take it and poke at it with a pencil and tell people, well, see, I'm right. It's cirrhosis of the liver, you know, and she's showing it to people who of course have no knowledge of medicine or, or anything. One more side note, Dr. Hazard did all of these autopsies on an ironing board in her house. She put the thin little body, the skeletal remains of a human being on a wooden ironing board and then cut them apart. Not only would she do that, she would also take out the gold teeth, which was very popular at the time. People had fillings, and they were gold. She would take that gold out and give it to the neighbor, a, a dentist, who would then pay her for the gold so he could use it in his practice. So she left nothing to waste. All of Claire's clothing was of the highest quality. And people would see Dr. Hazard wearing those items when she was at the house. She would wear her robe. She would wear some of her dresses. So Dr. Hazard let nothing go to waste. Next. Oh, that's kind of spinning around there. The sisters, okay, here, here's the whole thing to understand. The sisters have were manipulated, obviously, by Dr. Hazard. And what was the motivation? Why was Linda always trying to get the money? Was it because Sam was whispering in her ear, you know, we need the money? No, it was because she had a grand plan. Her plan was to build a sanitarium, just like Kellogg had in Michigan. She was gonna make this sanitarium like a world destination. It was gonna be beautiful. It was gonna be a hundred beds. It was gonna be a white facility in the middle of the woods with sculpted gardens, tennis courts, a swimming pool. And to do all of that, she needed money. She killed these people or these people died under her care, but they were one of many. By the time they did all of the work on this case, which we'll talk about in a moment, they determined 20 to 40 people were probably victims of Dr. Hazard and her plans to get money to build that sanitarium. Next. I hope you can read this, I'm not gonna read it to you, but. I do sort of love this. this is a comic strip from the 1940s um, about uh, a Dr. Hazard in the sanitarium. It was such a famous case. 
that it got the attention of a, a lot of people, including this comic artist. And there were, uh, I think, five episodes to this. Um, the media called it, you know, the walking skeletons of Alala. They ran with the name Starvation Heights instead of Wilderness Heights, which is what, you know, people think, well, well did they call that Starvation Heights like later in the 50s or 60s? Is that something that you that you heard people say, you know, later in life? And I want you to know, like in 1912, the newspapers were calling it Starvation Heights. They were totally onto it. They were thinking that Dr. Hazard had some kind of power over these people. I mean, how could she not? How could she not have power to get them to do things like these treatments and hanging on to the bitter end? You know, what was it about her? Was it black magic? A lot of people wondered like, well, was she a witch? What, what, what was she? Next. We've had the trials of the century. You could say the OJ trial was the trial of the century. You know, if you're younger, maybe you say Casey Anthony. I don't know. There, there, are, there are a lot of them. But truly, for Kitsap County, there's no doubt that this was the 20th century's biggest trial. Um, people, you know, when she was charged with murder and doing all these things that she did, um, it was a sensation. People from reporters from all over the world came from Australia, from Britain. Um, they were there to cover this trial in a little no place town called Port Orchard, which is what where the county courthouse was. And this is the county courthouse here. Um, I, it was interesting, though, and it was noted in the press how many women came in support of her. Because here she was, remember, she was a doctor, which was very unusual. There weren't very many female doctors. But she was also very smart and very authoritarian and very sure of herself. So, you know, I kind of think like when I think about Dr. Hazard in 1912, I think about somebody like, I hate to say it, someone like a Martha Stewart, somebody who had charisma and was able to build something out of nothing. You know, if you think about it, it's the power of the person that commands all of the people around them. And Linda Hazard was in a lot of ways, I think ahead of her time. Next. The prosecuting attorney, you know, said she was a financial starvationist and there's no doubt about, doubt about that. When you think about it, their jewelry was missing. Their, all of their assets and there were, like I said before, it would have been millions of dollars that today were assigned to Dr. Hazard. Other patients too, the land that she lived on was from a patient who died, a state senator, L.E. Rader, who took the treatment and mysteriously died, leaving all of his assets and the property for her sanitarium. So all of that was on there. And Dr. Hazard was so convinced. And I, I kind of like this photo of Dr. Hazard. I've always called this pretty Linda. This is where she looks like her most demure, demure and, and attractive. A lot of other pictures show her more, I think of it as she was, which was very harsh. And um, so I, I like this photo, it's another side of her. Um, her whole case, her case was dependent on whether or not she could get people like Ivor Hagland, people on the stand that say, well, you know, she helped me. She was, uh, it was even though she killed my mom, um, she helped me. Uh, that kind of evidence she felt was crucial, but the judge said, no, none of your patients are going to be allowed to testify. And that just crushed her, that killed her. I mean, she was there on the steps of that courthouse every single day complaining about that, complaining about how the good part of her story was never gonna be told to anyone because of this judge. Next. This is a great shot. This is Dr. Hazard in the hair mug shot. So she was convicted. She was convicted of manslaughter after this sensational trial that went on for weeks. She was convicted and she was determined to be sent away to where? They had no place for women at that time. There was no women's prison. So the governor Lister, who was the governor at the time, sent her to Walla Walla. She was the only female there. She was sent for two to 20 years for manslaughter. She was told that she'd have to surrender her medical license and never treat another patient again. And she went huffing and puffing and went off to Walla Walla, but she went off with another plan. Next. I do want to mention, I, this is a photograph is new for me. It is Claire's grave. It's in Tacoma. 
and it's at, at American Cemetery in Tacoma. So if anyone wants to see it, um, it's there. Next. So she goes away. She goes away in about 1914, never to be heard of again, supposedly, except she gets the idea that she can come back from New Zealand where she's killed a bunch of people and done her own kind of treatment down there for a while. And she arrives back in Alala of all places. She doesn't have a medical license anymore. She's now a teacher. She calls herself the instructor of natural therapeutics. And she builds this sanitarium in Alala. And this is the only photograph I have of anyone else out there has one. I'd love to see it. It was quite a building for places like Alala that were tiny and forgotten. And when you look at this, you can see, you know, this is not finished. The building's not finished right here, but all those doors are patients' rooms. There were supposedly, it was a hundred bed facility and she did build tennis courts and she did have a swimming pool. Next. Here's the kicker to this story. As Linda has her, there she is toward the end of her life. She got arrested again and again and again for killing people under her treatment, this time as a teacher but she became ill. And in that house I showed you at the very beginning, she went into her bedroom and she said, I'm gonna save myself. I'm gonna take the treatment. I'm going to fast and get better. I'm gonna show everybody that I know what I'm doing. And she died 38 days later. Next. It's bizarre when you think about a story about a person who has such a checkered past, so many things that we wonder about, so many motivations, and yet she's still something to people out there today. That's what's weird about it. If you go online, there are people who follow her, who believe in her treatment, and maybe there is some validity in her treatment. I mean, I know I need to go on a fast, but not for 38 days. She has an idea, you know, that, that, that there's a person out there that, that might have some knowledge, so, so people log on, Google her, and find out. You'll see that it's out there and that her book is out there. I want to show, I think, which is the last slide. I want to talk about, oh, it's not. This one here is. Uh, this is the last, these are the last pictures I got of Dr. Hazard. This is how she looked to most people of Alala all the time she lived there. She always wore white, like a nurse's uniform. Her hair was white. People said she even had a white little dog that went with her everywhere she went. And a woman named Bernice Smith sent me these photographs um, after the book came out. And she said she had gone to Starvation Heights. Her mom sent her there for a treatment. And she said, I don't even know why I was sent there. She says, but I know I was really glad when I got out of there because I was super scared. So these are from Bernice. This is a scrapbook that she kept. It shows Sam Hazard, this is 1937. Um, and of course, both of them would be dead within the next two years. And there shows Bernice um, and that last shot. I think she's on the ferry going home. She's free of Starvation Heights. There's been a lot of talk about paranormal activity at Starvation Heights. And I've been there. So this is Halloween, right? So I want to tell you this. I believe that places carry the imprint or the residue of things that are bad. I feel like there's some energy there that you can feel, whether it's a coldness or just a feeling. Some people have talked about being in that site and feeling cold air pour over them. And I've been there when there were paranormal investigators looking at it and I can roll my eyes like the best of them. I can think this is ridiculous, you know, when they're holding their camera up, you know, I'm gonna get a shot of a ghost right behind me, you know, or whatever. This next photo I wanna show you kind of makes me a weird believer. This photograph, which I think is Dr. Hazard or certainly looks like her, was taken by paranormal investigators who did not know they had it on their video roll until after they got home and watched the video. And I look at that and I think, well, you know, I feel something when I'm there that's kind of creepy and maybe there really is something. So that's my creepy Kitsap story for you. Back to Josh or somebody. <laughs> All right. That was awesome, Greg. Um, I just found myself completely enveloped in your presentation. It, 
um, it's just amazing every time I hear the story. Um, you just, there are so many moments where you just gasp. <laughs> you just go, how is this possible? And then that happened again and again and again. And it's, it's one of the reasons um, it has resonated so widely. Um, and much thanks to you on, on that, but a great presentation. So thank, thank you. you. We, have, we have many questions. Uh, you know, I want to start with a little levity here. Um, uh, I will be honest with you. I was not aware of the, um, the diet regimen, if you could call it that, of asparagus water. And um, I just want to say, as someone who appreciates lowbrow humor, it can't have smelled very good around. <laughs> that, that's what I thought tonight. <laughs> that was the first time it crossed my mind. <laughs> Moments before in the bathroom. Yeah, but as uh, as of course tragic as there as the rest of the story, you got to find humor in these things, um, uh, and and what a tragic story it is. Um, we have some great questions, but you know, one of the I have one just really off the off the top of my head. Um, I have two. Um, number one, uh, her sentence by the governor was commuted. That's that right. Okay, and don't, don't even know why. We don't know why. And so there's no documentation no. on that. Okay, it's just a mystery. You knew the right people. Okay, I guess I so. Think about okay. that. I mean, I think there's something to that. Yeah. She was super well connected. Mm. You know, she was at a higher level than the average person in, in who she knew. So I think that did probably help her. But yeah, I did request the records. You know, I got her prison records, you know, it, talked about you know she did some painting and stuff there was notes in there about what she was doing but yeah no reason for the commutation wow wow okay um the the other thing of course that comes to mind is you know uh, sadly um to this day we see a lot of crimes um particularly the the most heinous being murders um in which it's it's whenever i see one and we hear about things like the insanity defense it almost feels like someone who can commit a murder it, you you have there there is uh in many cases of course mental illness on board in some fashion um i wonder with her with the pressure that she was under to um uh to to pay the bills with the ambition the boldness the delusions of grandeur that she had being kellogg of building um this huge sanitarium those pressures uh, applied made uh, made her do things that were dastardly, and uh, of course, and sort of uh, knock down these these um, you know maybe piece by piece um, uh, sort of continuing to make more extreme the, these the the way she would operate, taking the gold out of people's teeth, etc. But um, how much do you think was she um, simply a crazy? person um, versus how much did her circumstances guide her in that direction? Or was it a combination of both? I'm, I'm sure it's a combination because we can't really know. People always say, well, why did they do the crime? You know, anything I've ever written. It's like, we can never know for sure what's in somebody's mind. But I do believe this is a narcissistic person. She is somebody who thinks the rules don't apply to her. You know, she, and if I have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, I'm gonna do it. I mean, that's basically what her philosophy was. I think her husband pushed her more and more in that direction. You know, and you, and you think about that. You're surrounded by people who tell you what you wanna believe, or a lot of people are, especially at a high level. So she's got people whispering in her ear, you can do this, Lynn. you can do this, you can be this. You know, we can do this. And if that tendency wasn't there, to really believe this grandiose thing that she was going to create, you know, that's if she didn't have that, she wouldn't have gone in that direction. So I think the cast of characters around her enabled her to be all that she wanted to be. It's just too bad that, you know, a lot of people had to die to get there. I see, I see. Okay, um, and we've got uh, we've got some great questions here. Um, when you investigated these stories, did you find yourself understanding the desperation to believe? or find any credibility in her regimen? Was there a sort of any uh, uh, integrity there um, through the lens of her victim's sickness? There were people in Olala, and when I wrote the book, I interviewed 
anybody that actually knew her. And they were all people who knew her at, when they were children, okay? Because so much time had passed. And there were a lot of people in all who did believe in her and felt like she was credible and that she was good, you know, that she had done uh, the best that she could, that she wasn't an evil person. So there's definitely that side to it. But when I got into it, and even I can relate it to something even more recent, which is like I watched that Nexium documentary on the, the called The Vow on HBO. And it's like, it's the charismatic leader. It's the person, you, you think that these are normal, nice people. Why do they fall for this stuff? They fall for it because there's somebody that's so compelling that is able to convince them of things that you and I would just like roll our eyes and say, forget about that. I'm not doing that. And she surrounded herself with people who moved that toward her and enabled her to do what she did. But yeah, did she, you know, people say, did she believe in the cure? 100%. Was it a good cure? Probably not. Yeah. And she believed it enough that it ultimately killed her. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, do you find some poetic justice in that at all? I'm sure you get asked that all the time. Yeah. Well, I love that ending. I mean, I think that's the best ending to the whole story because that really does leave you with what I think makes a compelling story. It isn't the, all the content of the book or of what happened. It's how we feel about it at the end. And when you think about, you know, like when you, when you think about a story you've heard, that ending, that coda, that ending to her story, the idea that she did believe in it is like a whoa. It makes you want to think about all that you've read and all that you wonder. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, another question for you. Um, was there any way at the time to look up which doctors were reputable? Uh, this is an age, of course, um, you know, um, I, I re recently read a book about the James A. Garfield assassination. Mm -hmm. Skeptics were, uh, you know, they, they, we were still learning about that stuff. Somebody shoved their finger into President Garfield's wound in his back, uh, and that probably introduced the infection that killed him two months later. Right. So, not real modern um, as far as science goes, at least uh, um, from, th from that case. Um, how would you know if you were a seeing a reputable doctor in, say, yeah. 19, uh, when she was operating in the early 20th century? Well, one, and, and that time, doctors were licensed. So they would have had to have gone through some kind of training to get that license. The one problem with this whole scenario is that Dr. Hazard came in that kind of a grace period, grandfathering kind of period when she arrived in Seattle, they, that, that window of that moment was if you say you have a license or could produce one, you got one, right? And she really didn't have one, but she lied and she got herself in. And that, I don't know how big that window was, if it was a year or two, but that's what made it happen. She slipped in there so that she could be a doctor instead of a, a nurse or whatever else she could have been. Fascinating, fascinating. and. Uh, and uh, the destruction of uh, the documents, too, at her college. That's also fascinating. Yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry, can't prove it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so this is another request from me um, personally, but I certainly would, would love to have this happen myself. But uh, our question or asks, uh, Greg, would you ever consider doing another tour of the sanitarium property? <laughs> no, you know what? The sanitarium does not exist anymore. Sure. So the answer is no. And it was a, it was a great treat when we did that for the libraries. Uh, we did that, I don't know, 10 years ago. I don't know what it was, a while, a while ago. So it doesn't look like there'll ever be another tour, but I think anybody who asked about that. Okay, but you can still feel it out there, right? Uh, as we talked about. In yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that, that you, and you can go to the old Alala Pioneer Cemetery where a lot of people feel like, you know, there's something there too. So, you know, paranormal, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I wrote about one of our earliest pioneers, one of the first women uh, uh, settler who died. Uh, her gravestone was at that cemetery and it was recently moved um, as they're doing a lot of restoration work at the nearby Bethel Cemetery. Huh. Fascinating story. Um, uh, is the property where the sanitarium was, I mean, is it owned by someone else now? Who has oh, yeah. It's all, yeah. I mean, there's a private home where the house stood. I see. And then there's a separate parcel across the road where the foundation of the sanitarium still exists out in the woods. Okay. Okay. Not related to the people who own the, the house. So I, I just bring that up because obviously 
if it's private property now, we want to be respectful of the fact that someone does live there. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, seriously, people have showed up there in the middle of the night with shovels. Wow. And people have come from anywhere, all parts of the world, because they want to get a look at it. So, so sure. it does not exist. Yeah. And it is someone's home. And yes, you're right. Be respectful and uh, appreciate it from the road if you must be close to it, but don't go on the property. Understood. Understood. Um, someone asked, how much research did you do for this book? It's very clear to me that you obviously um, have the way you eloquently speak about this. Uh, there was no stone unturned uh, for Greg Olson, but I'm wondering, tell me, uh, how, how long did it take you to do all this research? Every true crime book takes about a couple of years to gather the information, you know, a year, a couple of years and a year and a half, and then another year to maybe write it. So they, they take a lot of work. Um, this one here could not have been written if not for the fact that Kitsap County, uh, <laughs> Kitsap County had no records on it, nothing, the court system. Thank goodness, Dr. Hazard, the narcissist that she was, appealed her conviction because every single thing that was written about the case, including the trial transcripts, were sent to the state archives in Olympia. In fact, when I went there researching the book, I was the first person to ever ask for this stuff. So it was all packaged up with, you know, this vellum paper and weird little paper clips, shapes I've never seen a paper clip in, you know, back in those days, and, and ribbons that held the documents together. If I could not have had that backup, there'd be no book. So, you know, that's where you got to go. You got to tell the story. So people say, well, how do you know what they said in those letters? It's like, well, I got the letters. You know, how do you know she said this about that? It's in the transcript. So, I mean, the book is 100% true. All of the stuff that's in there, I mean, it's, it's a recreation of the truth and that it's told in a narrative way, but it's 100% researched. And I mean, I went to... Uh, Minnesota, where the bigamy case was, and I got all the files from that trial. I, I mean, and think about it, I wrote it during pre-internet times, which meant in those days, you had to go there. You had to go and ask some nice lady at the counter if they had anything and help, and help you. So, I mean, I got lots of help from those people, but I will tell you this, what made the book come alive for me was talking to the local people who knew her. And those vignettes are sprinkled throughout the book. And I think I love those more than anything because they put me right there. Wow, yeah. Um, in fact, our, uh, one of our remaining questions here is, did uh, any of those folks that you did interview, I think you might've mentioned this earlier, um, uh, but um, did any of them have nice things to say about Dr. Hazard? <laughs> uh, Irene Tallman, who I love, she's gone now, but she did have nice things to say about her. She thought that she was, you know, misunderstood, you know, that's about the only person <laughs> that really felt that way of a, a couple of other people felt like she might've done some good with family members who had taken treatment there because they lived. So remember, you know, she didn't kill everybody that went there. She probably, you know, I don't know what the percentage would be, but her percentage wasn't probably too bad. <laughs> you know, she had a lot more patients than deaths. Yeah. And that's part of what, sort of polluted, uh, if you will, um, the trial record. And uh, of course, um, as you mentioned, a lot, of, uh, a lot of testimony was thrown out that she couldn't present, but there is, it, it, when we're it's, it's like anything, when we're living through present times, it's hard sometimes to have an objective uh, point of fact to see things um, when the emotions are mixed in and um, not, not everything is, it, well, nothing really is, is so black and white that it's, it makes it hard to see that way. Right. I mean, as a reporter, you know this, and I know it as a writer of a longer form than, than a newspaper feature, yeah. which yeah. is you're only as good as the content that you can get, whether it's an interview with somebody or whether it's documents, you know, so it's like, we do our best to tell the truth, but it's only through like the luck that I went to one person that I got that part of the story. You know, there are probably a million other pieces to Linda Hazard's story that I didn't find and someone else will maybe one day or maybe they shouldn't find it. I don't know, but you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, and that's something, uh, you know, that I think resonates with me so much is 
when you do dig into something again, not, um, I have not written a book yet. I, I should, I hope to, um, but, um, the level that you go to, and, and sometimes I feel this, that you really do start to put a paint a picture and you try to imagine. And that's one of the beautiful things about history is you almost can. And I'm wondering if that's, it's sometimes though you you find yourself uh, with too many uh, you you just keep finding new questions you keep digging different rabbit holes I mean it, did, did you find with this book uh, a satisfaction of piecing together and really feeling like you could have been there at that time or are you are you still tortured about it in a way I'm tortured about everything. <laughs> no, no I, I feel like at, at the time, I mean, here's the funny thing. I've written a lot of books where I felt like it'd be great to go back and find out this or that or whatever. But I feel like with this particular book, I feel like because it's really the court case and it's based on these two sisters that I have it all there. I don't know what happened to them after the trial. I don't know what happened to Linda Hazard's remains, with, like who picked them up. You know, I know that she had two children and she was estranged from them. And I would like to have known more about that, but I don't really need to know it. They didn't live with her at the time. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I feel like that book is closed, but I have written other books where I feel as though there may be a piece of stone that I didn't turn that I wish I had. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I have one more question for you. The last question from one of our viewers, uh, I, I think you've kind of touched on this in you know, the pre-electricity days of, of the area and just the seclusion, the remoteness. Um, but why Olala for, why Olala? Oh my gosh, there's no more beautiful place in the world. <laughs> Come yeah. on, Josh, you've been to Olala, isn't it great? It's a, it's a beautiful place. I discovered there's a replica of the Washington Monument there not long ago. There you go, you can see it from Banner Road. It's one of our, <laughs> one of our high points. No, it is remote. And in those days, you know, the only way to get there was by boat, which was a, the Mosquito Fleet, a steamer would take you there. And, you know, it was just, to me, when I think about that time, 1910, even the 1920s, I do wish I lived there at that time. I find it fascinating and interesting and, and I, everybody, you know, knew everybody. Uh, and I feel like maybe that's my favorite era that time when things were changing and yet still slow and, and the world wasn't it was so big that we could get lost in it. I feel there's something about Alala even today that feels that way to me. And I tell people, you know, I used to live in Bellevue and I knew more people on day one moving to Alala than I did living in Bellevue all those years because the people, you know, we're in something together. We're out in the middle of nowhere and we're all together. And you, you don't have that in the big city. Or any, or even maybe anywhere else. I think Olala is very special. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, last question for you. Um, I, I've thought a lot about uh, this and other stories, of course, out of the early twentieth century, um, and and even before that. Um, and we talk about how this was remote, and this was something what, where uh, today it's hard to get records. Um, back then. Not only there were there were newspapers, of course, but there was certainly not uh, social media. There was certainly not the internet, uh, the information age, all of the things that we have, and the connectivity and the increasingly connectedness of the world. So I want to ask you, last but not least, is it possible that something like Dr. Hazard's sanitarium could that happen today? Well, for sure. There's no doubt. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking like, even like I was thinking any cult, you look at a cult because that is a group that is managed by one person, by one charismatic leader. And you can look at, I mean, like I mentioned the Nexium thing, a little more, a, la a later one where it's the Heaven's Gate where they are all getting ready to catch the tail of the comet. I mean, things that we think are ludicrous and, you know, yeah, of course it can happen. You know, it's susceptible people falling under the sway of somebody powerful. And that has been with us from the beginning of time and certainly ever not going to end anytime soon. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Greg, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. It's uh, time to continue here with uh, our events tonight. Um, thanks so much, ladies and gentlemen. For, um, you, God, it was a great presentation. <laughs>
I love, <laughs> I love hearing each and every time. <laughs> Um, so, um, one thing we want to do here is, um, we have some costume winners, I believe. I think that's, uh, that's next up on our agenda tonight. Um, I think we have some photos of them as well. Uh, oh my gosh. Yes. Um, Mala Mahela, I have to tell you, um, uh, this picture scared me, <laughs> but it is a great costume. Uh, Mahela, well done. Um, you are dressed here as Jane the Killer, and you are the uh, proud recipient of $25 to uh, one of my favorite bookstores, Ballast Book Company on Pacific Avenue. So, Mahela, congratulations to you. $25 gift certificate for what is, uh, to me, a, a, a genuine costume. <laughs> I, I, am, I am terrified right now. <laughs> Um, so nice job. Um, and in the adult category, we have a very special prize here. This goes to Robin Taylor. Robin, um, you are going home uh, with uh, a Kitsap County history, which I think is right over this shoulder here. Um, we all know and love this history book. Um, it's a $65 value. Um, if you don't have it, you need to get a copy you'll never be bored again. Um, I, uh, I honestly, uh, each time I write a story about an area in Kitsap County, I find myself looking at this and then trying to make deadline because I keep flipping through the dang pages because there's another and another and another and an anecdote and a big, big piece of history out of this book. It's a must have and congratulations uh, to uh, Robin in the adult category. Um, you also get a one-year North American Reciprocal Museum membership, uh, and that gives free, basically free admission to about uh, over a thousand museums in um, the United States. So congratulations to you. Um, and it's time for me to turn it back over to Angie. Angie, are you still with us there? I see Greg. Are you, oh, I see her coming. Here she comes. <laughs> Hi guys. Yeah, we just wanted to make one more pitch. Uh, again, this is a fundraiser. Uh, we really appreciate your time this evening and we appreciate your gifts. Uh, if you'd like to give, please do so at kitsapmuseum.org. Click a button and, and give away. Uh, great. I just wanted to say something about the importance of saving our history in the digital age. I really want you to know that emails and all of this stuff that goes off into ether is something that no one will be able to find in the future. And I think that if you are lucky enough to have an old family album or letters and things that are precious to you, they do carry historical significance a lot of times, not all of them, but some do. They tell the story of our lives and the way we lived. And I could not have written this book without people that had those pieces, those letters, those tales of growing up in, in Olala in the 1920s, you know, so I want to say that, you know, I do a lot of spring cleaning at my house, getting rid of stuff that I know my kids don't want, right? <laughs> but I think that I, I encourage people, especially my South Kitsap folks, that, you know, our story of where we live will be gone if we don't do something to preserve it in a place like a museum, either through donation or through donation of money or through donation of artifacts or something is really, really crucial. Um, and I wanna say one thing about, one little more story about Starvation Heights and how I was able to do that book. In 1935, a young man who worked at a publishing company in Alaska wrote a letter to the governor saying, I want all of Dr. Hazard's uh, materials from her stay at Walla Walla. When I got that file from the state, when I did it all those years later, his name was in there and his letter was in there. And I called him up. He was 89 years old. And he said, I've saved everything, Greg, because I knew someday someone like you would call and want that material and want that stuff. So I got Cliff Cernix material, which was a half completed manuscript, articles and things that I had not seen. But mostly I got the idea that I was connected through somebody who loved that story as much as I did. He couldn't take it to the finish line. And I did. So I want to tell you that you might have stuff like that. And if you don't save it or give it to someone who cares, you're doing all of us a shame. 
Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thank you again so much, uh, Greg, for, for being here tonight um, for the Kitsap uh, County Historical Society and Museum. And, and thanks again, Angie. And just to piggyback on that thought too, uh, you know, we are so fortunate here to have a great historical society that is preserving that history, that is making it possible for um, this great repository of our past, uh, of all the things, all of the legacies in Kitsap County, um, from Bainbridge Island to Hansville, uh, all the way from to Bremerton, uh, to Port Orchard, and of course, uh, down in Olala. <laughs> uh, and so um, it's so important that we continue to save that stuff. And so I just echo Greg in saying that again, and also um, all of the things that we have in, in history we just owe a great debt of gratitude um, to our historical society that will continue to preserve that for generations to come. So thanks everybody for tuning in. And uh, thanks again to Angie and thanks for the wonderful presentation, Greg. Um, and uh, it's been a pleasure having you here. Um, Greg, one thing uh, before we close, what, what can we expect from you next? I would love to know if you have a project coming up that you'd like to mention for us. Yeah, I mean, I do have a book out now called If You Tell, which is, it's been a huge bestseller. It's a story, a true story of three sisters surviving the world's worst mother. There's no doubt about it. Um, there's that book, but I just started a project uh, based in Spokane. It's about this, and this is all I'll say. It's a 20 year span of time. So it's one of those stories that's gonna take a lot of digging to get the true story, but it's about a transsexual serial killer. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Okay, well, we know you're going to dig in and find that truth and find that story. And so we'll look forward to that happening. All right, thanks, Dennis. I am gonna show you that I can walk. <laughs> uh, hey, there it is. Okay, <laughs> it's a miracle. Miracle. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, uh, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Of course, this uh, will be rebroadcast. You'll be able to watch this on YouTube again. And we're thankful that you participated. You came out this evening to hear some great Kitsap County history. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. And we'll see you again soon, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>